This is a passage that I'm sure all of us are extremely familiar with. We've done several earlier that we probably haven't done a ton of study on. Uh, in fact, one of the ones that I did earlier on was the Son of Man, which we've probably read and are familiar with, but may not have, have, have dove real deep into it. This is one you've probably heard a hundred lessons on before. And I think that that sometimes presents its own problems because while it's good that we're familiar with it and we should be, sometimes when you've studied something a lot, you feel like, okay, I've got that and there's not really something new to get from it. And so I think that we sometimes, without meaning to, and I'm saying this because I'm guilty of it myself, we'll sometimes look at the stories, especially in the Gospels that we've heard so many times, think we'll know that gloss over some of the things that we could learn from it. So uh, the primary passage we'll be using this morning is from the, jo the Gospel of John, and we'll be in uh, 13 verses 7 through 20. But it's interesting to me that I think this is, is such a profound and impactful narrative in the Gospels, and yet John is the only one that records it. And I think that that's interesting, and we may talk a, a little bit about that as we get into the lesson here. But I've always found that fascinating that this is one of my favorite stories about Christ, and yet John is the only one that saw fit to include it in his account of Christ's life. So I think before we really dive into the scripture itself, we do have to do a little setting of the table. A uh, little pun there because, of course, they're dining at a table when this happens. Uh, but remember that this falls on Thursday of the Passion Week. So that will kind of help us aim our minds towards the timeline of where this is. So this is after the triumphant entry, the cleansing of the temple, the episode with the fig tree, arguing with the Pharisees, and the disciples bickering. You may recall my last lesson that I taught here was about the bickering between the disciples and uh, getting John and James' mothers and mother involved in all of that. And so these things have all taken place prior to the episode we're going to be looking at today. And I think that that really helps kind of frame this because there has been an awful lot happened to this small group of followers of Christ in a short amount of time. And it's been some highs and some lows. We've seen, I mean, I don't know any other way to describe it as something than a high when you have people watching Christ come into Jerusalem as the prophets predicted on a colt and throwing down palm leaves and yelling Hosanna. And then you've also seen him get into a, a very heated discussion with the Pharisees. And that was something that I'm sure was very tense and, and they were rightfully so worried that something could happen to them. And so th there's been an awful lot of emotion and an awful lot of, I guess, things that would just wear you out is a good way to put it that has happened with this week so far. And this is winding down and coming close to the end of this week that has culminated in the reason they are in Jerusalem in the first place, which is today is the day of the Passover feast, which is the most sacred of all the Jewish holidays. And I would love to, and I probably will at some point, go into a study about all the parallels between the the Passover and the crucifixion. I mean, there's a lot, some of it's obvious, some of it's kind of subtle and under the surface, but I mean, the obvious one to me is the whole point of the Passover is to remember the deliverance from Egypt, wherein in the 10th plague, they took the blood of a lamb that had been sacrificed and spread it over the doorpost so the angel of death would know not to visit that house. I mean, that's a fairly obvious parallel between that and the Christ story, a lamb who was slain and his blood covers you from being visited by the wrath of God. So, I mean, there's, again, we could go into a lot of detail on that. That's a lesson in and of itself. We're not going to do that. But I do want you to keep that in mind that this is the way that Jesus and his disciples spent Passover. This is an event that happens during their celebration of the holiday that the Jews consider the most sacred holiday on the Jewish calendar. And also remember because I think that this will help put us in the right frame of mind as well. This takes place directly before the Last Supper in the Garden of Gethsemane. So chronologically, this is, happens directly before the Last Supper. I mean, probably just moments before. 
And then, of course, later that night, the Garden of Gethsemane happens as well. So we are about to see Jesus taken away. And there's a fair bit of reason to believe that what Christ has been doing for the past, in the book of John, probably chapter or so. So we, we've seen about two chapters of him preparing his disciples for what's going to happen to him. He's been sometimes hinting at it, sometimes just straight out saying what is going to happen and explaining that this is what is going to happen, I'm going to be taken away. And so he, everything he has been doing for the past several chapters has been slowly building to this, and he's been trying to, I think, mentally prepare his disciples for what they are about to witness and what's going to happen to them. So let's go ahead and look at the lead up to the passage we're going to be focusing on today. If somebody would for me read John 13 verses 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So, this is the event that precedes the speech we're about to read. Because, of course, the focus of this study is on the letters in red. So, this is... The, the action that leads into that, that he's about to be explaining between him and his disciples. So with that, I would like to ask, is verse 1 here, is that a reflection from John, or is that new information through inspiration? Where he says that Jesus, knowing his hour had come, and he would depart from this world uh, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Is that... John self-reflecting and remembering that, or is the Spirit giving him extra information he did not already have? Well, it's some of both, because the Spirit gave them all the guidance. It said he would tell, remind them of everything Jesus had said and done, so to me it's inspired. Well, I think it's inspired. Um, and you're right, the scripture does, one of the things that the scripture explains to us about inspiration is that he's, it's, he's going to give him recollection. So I think that that's certainly accurate and that's biblical. Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out, did he actually know that this was what was going through Christ's mind at the time? Was John sitting there while he's seeing these events unfold? Did he already think about these things or was the spirit kind of leading him in this writing so you're saying maybe it was something that at least originated in john's mind but it was something that he only realized after he had seen all these things take place i think too uh, because he was the only one that included this john had a it seems like he had a different perspective in his writings than maybe the the other gospels uh, uh, I don't know if it's more of a sensitive perspective or, or what have you, but uh, it was definitely different. Aspect of that maybe that what John is is reflecting on is something that maybe John had realized that maybe the other apostles and and writers of the Gospels didn't. I don't know if that's the case, and, and to be honest, I'm asking this question not really knowing the answer. I mean, I think it's possible that even if he had had no influence of the Spirit at all, John could just look back on what was happening and probably come up with this, but I don't know that for sure. And as you brought up, maybe it was something that kind of originated in his memory, but the Spirit was helping him remember. It, it's hard to say. Uh, but either way, I mean, we know that it's a fact because it's part of the inspired word. But I do think, regardless of whether that is the case or not, I do find it really fascinating that John is setting up his readers, us, to understand this is what Christ was thinking about while this was going on. And I think that that is not unimportant. Because he's saying while he's engaged in this act of service, while he is washing the feet of the disciples, 
what Christ is thinking about and what is on his mind right now is that he's about to have to suffer and die for the sins of the world. This is something that he was aware of and something that he was thinking about at the time. It wasn't something that was a surprise. It didn't sneak up on him. And I think the reason that that is included specifically is to be instructive to us that while Christ certainly could have been excused for not thinking about the disciples, not really being in teaching mode, as it were, he was. He didn't have to be. But in this moment, when he had the option of being worried about himself, he chooses instead to minister to his disciples, to do something for them, to serve them. And I think that that serves as an inspiration for us that there's going to be times where we could justify our own problems and being worried about them and maybe be a little less concerned about others and be a little less concerned about serving. But the example that Christ gives us is that even when something as harrowing as Christ is about to go through, the most harrowing thing any human being has ever had to endure, he was still worried about, concerned about, and preparing his disciples for what was going to come. He was thinking more about their preparation at this point, even more so than his own. And that's not insignificant either. Took this opportunity, knowing that this he was about to die, mm -hmm. that they would remember this. It's it's like when you're with a loved one who's who's um, about to pass away, and, and you remember conversations from that more so than a lot of conversations or any conversations you had prior to that that time, and maybe it was more significant to them to realize, you know, what it's it's more important to be a servant than you know trying to be <coughs> the master or whatever, using that to leave that into their family. That's a good point. If you want to make an impression, I mean that would be the time to make it, right? When you have a, a person that's on their deathbed, typically they say something pretty significant if they know they're about to die. Uh, a good example with that I don't know how many of you have ever watched the show How I Met Your Mother, but there's one episode that revolves around one of the characters' dads dying, and they're all trying to remember what the last thing that he said to them was, and that becomes the theme of the whole funeral. And uh, at one point, it was something silly about just he recommended a movie, and that's because the man didn't know he was about to die. But Christ does. He knows it. It's coming up, and maybe he saw this as an opportunity. Is like, okay, let me go ahead and drive a message home here because if I do it right now while I stri strike while the iron's hot, maybe it'll sit with them a little longer. So th that's a good point. Maybe that was part of the calculation. Why do you think John includes the part about Judas? I, I mean, why with this setup and when he's talking about the washing of the feet, uh, why does he point out here that the devil has already entered into the heart of Judas. Why, why add that little reflective note there? I thought about that. that Jesus washed his feet as well. Mm -hmm. He was providing a service to him as well as others. He doesn't show any partiality. He didn't wait till Jesus left. I, I don't know what the whole meaning of that is, but to me, he, he treated them all equal. Yeah, I think both of you are exactly right. I think that it is to illustrate two things. First of all, I think John wants to make it absolutely abundantly clear with no doubt in anybody's mind, Judas was there, Judas's feet were washed. Because maybe if we were looking at it without that little note, we could have like worked it out in the timeline in our own head that maybe Judas has already departed and so Judas isn't present with them. We might have thought, okay, well, maybe... Judas was there, maybe Jesus washed Judas' feet, but it was one of those things that Judas was kind of on the fence at this point, and he wasn't really sure if he was going to betray them. No, 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 that's not what John says. The gospel very emphatically says Judas was there, Jesus washed his feet, and more importantly, the devil had already entered into his heart. He had already made up his mind, he's made his bed, he has made this decision to betray Jesus. And so even though the betrayal hasn't happened yet, the actual moment of betrayal hasn't happened yet. In his heart, the betrayal has already happened. He is already a traitor to Jesus Christ when Christ chooses to wash his feet. 
And I think that that really emphasizes the thing that Paul talks about in Romans 5, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The fact that Judas is a sinner, uh, the fact that he is betrayed and rebelled against Jesus already in his heart doesn't change the fact that Jesus still loves him. And I think that that is the reason he includes that note. Mm -hmm. said when I was looking at you there, you know, God tells us we're supposed to love who? Our enemies, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, in a way, this is thought when you were talking about that came to my mind, was Jesus is showing them you treat your enemies with respect and whatever and let that walk on their guilty consciences. That's where he puts fire in their brain suffering, I guess, because anybody that does bad to you, at some point they're going to have some guilty feelings along the way in their life. It may not be immediate, but it can be later on. So. Right, and even though Jesus has the advantage of foresight, he knows that this is going to happen because of prophecy and also because he knows the hearts of men. He understands that humans don't. And so this may also be working, like you said, as an example to us to remind us that even if maybe you suspect that something, somebody might be plotting against you, in this case he doesn't even suspect, he knows for sure. But he still continues to do what he taught his disciples to do, which is to love people regardless of what they think of you. So let's go ahead and read this passage, Luke 22, 24 through 30, which happens at the Last Supper as well. If somebody would volunteer to read that for me, please. also arose among them as to which of them was to be uh, regarded as the greatest. And he said to them that kings of the Gentiles uh, exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called uh, benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatness among you become as the youngest and the leader as one of one who serves. For who is a greater one who reclines at the table or one who serves it is uh, is it not the one who reclines at the table but I am among you as the one who serves <coughs> you are those who uh, have stayed with me in my trials and I uh, assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel This event is recorded in Luke. The washing of the feet is not. So here's my question. The dialogue that we just read, does it take place before or after the washing of the feet? Does it matter? That's a good question. I think that it does. But I also think if it really mattered, like if it was something we had to know, we would have the chronology there. And the reason that I asked that question and to make you think about it is, in Luke, there's basically an explanation of the principle that is displayed in the washing of the feet. John just tells the washing of the feet. And so I think that there is an interesting dichotomy there where Luke is giving the philosophical sermon, which is the application of the washing of the feet. So one includes sort of the, the theoretical side, one includes the practical side. And I'm not sure exactly why there's not an account that includes both of them. You could estimate, because this takes place after the Lord's Supper and in the the Gospel of John, it takes place before that you could say that this takes place after he washes their feet. However, we also know that the Gospel writers, and this was just something that was a literary function of writing in this day, chronology was less important than the message. And so it may not be 100% chronologically exactly the order of events in which place they occurred. It's possible that Jesus gave this sermon directly before the washing of the feet. I tend to think, based on the way that John describes it, that Jesus said nothing got up, started washing their feet, 
had the Last Supper and then added this as an addendum afterward. I don't know that for sure. It's possible that he says this before washing their feet and then actually uh, carries it out by example and then washes. But I tend to think, just based on the chronology, it's more likely that it happens afterward. But, but as you pointed out, I, I don't know that it really matters philosophically because both things did happen. Uh, but I guess the best way to describe it is in Luke, Jesus explains the lesson and John, he carries it out. And so we're kind of getting both of those. And I think that there's a great deal to learn from both of them. But the, the point of this lesson, and I want you to remember a couple of lines here, especially the greatest among you must be the youngest. That's going to be important in this lesson a little bit later. So let's go ahead and read the actual passage that we're going to be talking about this morning, John 13, 6 through 11. And if somebody would volunteer to read that for me. Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash, wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Why do you think Jesus says that Peter can have no part of him unless he does this? I mean, I think it's obvious that he was motivating him to allow him to do this. But beyond that, what was the point? You don't allow me to wash your feet, you'll have no part in me. Kind of obvious to me that uh, if you're not going to let me teach you and serve you, then how are you going to serve me? Maybe not. I think that is correct, but I, I'm not sure culturally if Peter got it in the moment. Like upon reflection, I think he probably did. Yeah, exactly. I, I think upon reflection, he probably would have gotten it, but you're right in the moment because that wasn't, that wasn't Jewish custom, that wasn't culture. Your, your teacher was, you were the servant of your teacher, not the other way around. I think that that may have been true in the long term, but right here in the moment, I don't think so. But that's a good point. Any other thoughts on that? A, I love these that have multiple meanings, right? Mm -hmm. If you just take it out of the context of what's going on, Jesus is saying, if you don't let me wash you, you've got no place with me. <coughs> that's true. You know, are you washed in the blood? You know, it, this isn't a full wash. He's saying if that is a very powerful just statement on its own outside of the context of what's going on. And then when you take it further, he's saying, you know, you have to experience my service because you have to serve. That's how we continue, I guess, demonstrating our being with him is how we treat other people. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, first of all, you have the idea that there is no one that can come to God in His presence unless you are washed by Christ. I think that's fairly obvious that if we do not have that cleansing that Christ does for us, we have no chance and we have no part in Him. I mean, in the, we, later in the epistles, we see this emphasized over and over again, that the way you come to Christ, the way you have a part in His inheritance, is through the washing of baptism and the forgiveness of sins. And so there's the, the larger philosophical vision, and then when you zero in on Peter, it has a more immediate idea right here that unless Peter can learn to serve the way Christ is serving him, he's not going to be useful for the kingdom. And I think that the fact that the line is included in there that um, you're not really going to understand this until later, I think that that is instructive on Peter's part too. And I think maybe that in a very small way, and I don't want to get off of our primary topic here, is a good lesson for us too, 
that sometimes we're going to do things that the Bible demands of us that we don't fully understand, that there's going to have to be some level of faith that we take out on to just kind of trust that God knows what he's talking about. And even though we don't see the immediate benefit spiritually, it's going to come around later. And so I think that there may be an aspect of that here with Peter as well, that he's saying, you may not get it right now, but I promise it's going to pay off. You're going to understand it later. Just have some faith in me and, and let me do this for now, and, and you'll understand why in the long term. Imagine if the record said, I washed Judas, Judas' feet, but not Peter's feet, right? Talking about indicating they're all there. What would, what would that have done long term for Peter's regret later on? Yeah, I never thought about that angle, but that's a good point. Um, how does, I don't, I feel bad being harsh on Peter. I really do, because I love Peter. I think he's a character, and of course we know eventually that he becomes kind of the unofficial leader of the apostles in certain ways. Um, certainly not, you know, to the level of palpacy or anything, but, but certainly Christ tells him to lead your brothers a, a couple chapters after this when he's, uh, talking about the, the breakfast at the, the seashore and, and that kind of thing. And so he does kind of become the leader of the apostles in certain ways. And yet, I love Peter, but man, he misses the mark here three times in a very short amount of time. And it, it's something that uh, I used to sort of jokingly say to my radio callers when they would call in and say something just completely off the wall. It's like, you know, it takes talent to be that wrong that often in such a short amount of time. And I kind of feel that way with Peter here. I love him, but at the same time, I mean, three times Jesus tries to use this as a teaching moment, and three times Peter comes up with the wrong answer. How does he do that? How does he come up with the wrong thing three times? But the others might have been thinking that. Now that does happen. We, we see elsewhere in the Gospels where kind of all the disciples think something, but Peter, because... I guess he's the most rash and has the biggest mouth, which also I relate to, um, is the one that kind of becomes the voice of all the apostles. Like they, they all think something, but Peter's the first one to say it because he just happens to be the one that's quickest on the draw. It was hard for him. He just wanted to be all in with Christ. He just wanted to be sure he was mm -hmm. all in. Right, and that's a sentiment we can respect, right? I mean... Peter is desperate to get the right answer, and that's a good thing. It really is. But sometimes in his desire to get the right answer, he doesn't let things happen, which is a, a, a problem that I find I have myself, and that's maybe the reason I relate to him here. I, I so want to be able to get the right answer and get it quickly that sometimes I don't just let things play out. And, and maybe that's a personal failing on my part that I lack patience in some areas. And I think that maybe that's what's going on here with Peter, is that you got to love his enthusiasm. You really do. I mean, he really, really wants to get it right. He really wants to show his love and affection for Jesus. He really wants to be, you know, the perfect disciple. But sometimes his desire to do that ironically leads him to say something dumb. But normally, even when that happens, Jesus isn't mad at him. And I think that the reason for that is because he recognizes he does have that enthusiasm and that passion sort of undergirding all of that. And that's part of the reason that he does that. I think Peter maybe found it so hard to accept that Jesus was going to die. Maybe he was so into the other scenario that the, that the apostle wanted that he was just resisting it up till the end. Because he wanted to take the sword, he cut off Malchusier. Mm -hmm. He just, he just couldn't get it. He didn't, he didn't want to get it. I would say. Well, and we see that elsewhere in the gospel accounts too, where Jesus just out and says, "I'm going to be taken and I'm going to die," and Peter basically brushes off like, "Ah, it's not going to happen." Um, which again, in retro. His attitude. His attitude. Just, I was just to say the same thing, Caleb. From the from the inception of Jesus' ministry, Peter always had that attitude. Oh, that's not going to happen to you. You know, you, you talk that way, but it's not going to be that way, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and exactly what you, I was just didn't want to interrupt you, but that's no, exactly no, the way that you're fine. his whole ministry. Mm -hmm. I think what Bobby's saying is he, that is exactly what it is, is that he just couldn't get his mind back around. 
because if you know of anybody in the inner circle, you know Peter was that that one of those men. And you know there was the apostles, but then he was right there, you know, attached to Jesus' hip. It seemed like through his entire ministry. I mean, he saw the man transfigured. You know. Yeah, him, James, and John. You know, he saw that with his own with his own two eyes. So getting his mind wrapped around the fact that he was going to let himself sacrifice himself, he just I don't think he could fathom that. No, and that's an excellent point. And so, in a sense, Peter, who, remember, is the one that gave the confession that you are the Christ, the Lord, it just, he rectified those two things in his mind. That there's a God and he has the ability to die, that just doesn't make any sense. And so, I think, you know... To, he's going to allow himself. Not that he is going to die, but he's just going to, he's going to sit back and let it... You know, he's talked about it. Right, he's going to offer it up. I'm going to allow that to come to me. I'm going mm-hmm. to do this for you. I choose to do this. Not we're going to have some this great big battle and someone's going to kill me through some kind of combat, physical combat, but I'm going to choose to have all this stuff happen to me. I think that's what he had a hard time. And I'm not saying I wouldn't either. If I, would, if I was with that man the whole time, knowing what I knew and saw and what I saw, it'd be hard to wrap your mind around that. Well, yeah, I mean... It's part of the reason that Jews had such a hard time accepting Christ is because of all those things that you're talking about. Like I said, we're we're here 2,000 years later, and this is something we've been aware of our entire life. But for everybody surrounding Jesus, this was a completely new concept. Right. And and so Peter having to struggle with this and rectify it in his own brain. Um, Jesus raised people from the dead. Mm-hmm. You know, that's pretty significant power there. And, yeah, you, it's um, hard to imagine. And you tell me you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, and then you're going to let it happen. You're going to basically fall on your own sword type mentality. It's, that's tough. Right, I mean, we talk about apologetics. Who had more apologetic evidence that Christ was who he said he was than Jesus? He's been with them the whole time. He's seen countless miracles at this point. And that's not even counting the way that this man talks the way that he speaks to other people, the way he relates to other people, the way that he knows things about people that no one else does. That's the reason that, Christ, that Peter is able to make this confession about Christ. But at the same time, he's watching this event play out. And I think that Peter makes the mistake of believing that he gets what's going on when he really doesn't. And I think, kind of going back to the lesson that we had last week about approaching Christ as a child, Peter's not really doing that here. I think he means to, but what's going on here is that Peter, Peter is not, A, just trusting that what Christ says is going to be, which is his first mistake, and, and the second part is he does have a childlike eagerness, which is good, but at the same time, he's, he's having a hard time accepting what Christ is saying to him instead of taking it at, at face value to some degree. And because of that, he thinks, I have the right answer, and so the right thing to do here would be to deny Christ washing my feet. And Jesus says, no, no, that's not the right answer. He's like, oh, okay, um, then wash my feet and my hands and my head. He's like, no, Peter, just, just let me do what I was going to do. Um, and, and I do think that, of course, we see what Peter becomes, and I think he gets the lesson eventually, like, like Jesus alludes to here in verse 7, but I do think it was something that took him a while to get there. Uh, Let's go ahead and read John uh, 21, verses 17 through 19. This happens after the crucifixion, uh, a conversation between him and Peter. So let's go go ahead and see how Peter's attitude has changed here. If someone would read verse 21, 17 through 19. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show that by what kind of death he was, by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. This passage contains three things that, at least in Christ's ministry, this verse shows are synonymous. Love me. Feed my lambs. 
follow me. Now these are all different concepts, but they all essentially amount to the same thing. If you're following Christ, you're going to love him, you're going to feed his lambs. If you're feeding Christ's lambs, it's because you love him and you're following him. So all these things coincide together. They're a, sort of a, a matched set. And so because of that, I think when we talk about Peter eventually, Jesus sort of giving this prediction that you, you don't understand now, but you're going to get it at some point, this is what he's talking about. There's going to be a time where you're old, where you're not able to move around and do what you want to like you are now. That's the kind of service that Jesus was predicting for him. He's saying, you, you may not understand what I'm doing right this second, but there's going to come a time where you get it. And I think that that is an indication to us that following him, that caring for the flock, that is something that comes with diligence and it takes time. And it was going to be some time where Peter had actually gone through this service. And by the way, where it talks about him not being able to, to move around like he would have, I don't think that that was just old age, especially not from what we know from the historical record of how Peter died. I think that this is something that came from beatings, stonings, persecution, not unlike what Paul went through. And then, of course, we know from the historical record that Peter eventually was crucified upside down. And so where it talks about Peter not being able to go with Christ and not being able to follow in his footsteps at the moment, he couldn't then, but eventually he would. And that's because he lived out the kind of service that Jesus is showing them in the washing of the feet. And so he doesn't get it right here in the moment, but Peter does get it eventually. I think that what that illustrates to us is that service is not a skill that can be understood through study alone. Being kind of an academic myself, I would like it if everything in the gospel just happened through theory. Like I could just study it, okay, I've got it now, and then I just move on to the next topic, but service isn't like that. And really the gospel isn't like that either. Service is something that has to be learned through experience. You can't get it just by understanding the precepts. You can't just understand the importance of it in the Bible. You have to actually engage in it to be able to understand it. And Peter hasn't really done that a whole lot so far in the gospel narrative, but he will at one point. And so when Jesus tells him he's going to understand, what he means is you're going to go through a similar level of persecution and a similar level of service that I am going through now. Not quite to that degree, but... You're going to follow in my footsteps in that way. Because the thing is, our brains must be trained to serve. We don't do it naturally. It's not something that comes organically to us. We have to learn to serve other people. And so it's not something that we can just sort of stumble backwards into. I agree that some people have more of a propensity to serve than others, but every human being is born selfish. We have a fallen nature, and because of that, to actually serve other people, to care more about their needs than our own, and to be able to give up things on our behalf so that they can have something, that's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of experience. And it's something that we have to constantly dedicate ourselves to in order to be able to actually do it. Also, it's not really about getting the right answer, it's the right choices. And I think that that's something that Peter needs to trying to, as it were, and it, being somebody that likes to do that myself, I, I get it, but sometimes it's better to just be more worried about the choice that you're making and what you're doing rather than what you're saying. And I think it's also important to remark here that biblical love is like biblical faith. Neither one of them is real unless it's followed up by action. And so Jesus could have just given the sermon in Luke and left it at that. But we also have the revelation from John that he didn't just give them a sermon that night, he lived a sermon that night. He actually did something to them that displayed exactly what he was talking about. And I think that that's important as well. Faith without works is dead. Well, love without works is also dead. It's not real biblical love unless it's something that is manifested in our service towards other people. So let's go ahead and, and read the rest of this in John 13, 12 through 16. Somebody would volunteer to read that, please. 12 through 16. Yes, sir. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and reclined at the table, again he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? 
You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. Um, real quick here, I'm going to close this out. Priests under the Levitical laws are required to wash both hands and feet before approaching Yahweh. I think that that is something that is significant here. Remember that the apostles were also travelers, and there's a good chance that their feet were, you know, needed some cleaning. I'll just put it that way without grossing anybody out. And so this was not an elegant job. This was not something that probably was done in just a couple of minutes. This was something that took some time that Jesus would have had to have carefully carried out as he's going through this. And uh, let's also keep in mind that culturally, this wasn't just a menial task. This wasn't just a, for lack of a nicer way to put it, a gross task. This was a task that was always given to the lowest ranking house slave, almost always a woman. And again, I'm, I'm not condoning this, I'm just stating this is the way it was culturally women were seen as the lowest rank. This was something that was so beneath somebody to do that they saw even a younger male slave would not be forced to do this. This was woman's work. And so Jesus doing this is essentially putting aside not only his own cultural notions that would have surrounded him, he's also saying, I am willing to do this for you, putting aside my status as your teacher, putting aside my status as a free person and also as a man. This is how he was humiliating himself intentionally to show them that this is what you need to be willing to do for others. And by the way, this wasn't even just Jewish culture. This was universal in the world at this time. All these things that I just told you about it always being done by the youngest, lowest ranking house slave and almost always a woman true in Greek culture, that's true in Roman culture, this was universal in the world at this time. And so the thing I really want uh, to leave you with here, um, I could have gone through some in the the Old Testament, there's some examples of that, Um, but if we could just read the last three, that and we'll, we'll be dismissed. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking about all of you, I know the ones whom I have chosen, but this is happening so that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats the bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives receives him who sent me. Christ was abasing himself to show an example of what real biblical love means. It means you put aside your own pride, you put aside what you need, and you do for others regardless of what the task is. And the reason that he includes here at the very end that someone has raised up his heel against me, he's doing this for the man that is going to betray him. He's doing this for the person that he had the most cause in the world to hate. And he chooses not only to love him, He chooses not only to treat him well, he chooses to humiliate himself in the presence of his greatest enemy in order to show his disciples that if you receive other people the way I'm receiving you, the way that I am showing hospitality towards you, then you are going to be disciples of mine. And that's what we have to do as Christians to be able to truly love people the way Jesus did. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I apologize for running over a little bit. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.